Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you guys again and come to your homes on this Sunday morning. Uh, God is such a good God. Uh, he is a good, good father. And on this Father's Day, I want to wish every father out there going to be father uh, a very, very, very happy Father's Day. Thank you for the difference that you make in your family's lives. Thank you for the blessing that you are to your community, to your family, to your children. And I pray that you will continue to be a blessing to everybody that you encounter. Uh, we hope that you got the goodies and the treats and the boxes that uh, our team put together for you guys. Uh, thank you so much for our, uh, our kids ministry as well as Meryl and the team for putting those boxes together. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the boxes. For those of you who don't know, uh, we got a bunch of uh, uh, self-care items. Uh, I don't know if they're trying to tell us that we need to take care of ourselves a lot better, uh, if we need to put on deodorant or whatnot, but we truly do appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for uh, your love and uh, just thinking of us during this Father's Day. Uh, we love you guys very much. Thank you so much once again. Uh, man, I want to jump into the Word of God this morning. Um, God is good all the time. Uh, <clears throat> today, um, you know, I was praying and asking God for wisdom uh, onto what to speak today. And uh, the more I prayed about it and the more I thought about it, uh, God has been speaking to me at length about uh, the fatherhood of God. And the more I learn it and the more I study it, I fall in love with who God is as a father to me. And today I want to kind of just share a particle of that idea, a small, uh, uh, you know, part of this greater chasm of the greatness and the fullness of God. So I pray that you'll be attentive this morning. Uh, next Sunday, we launch our brand new series, and we'll be announcing it this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, I pray that uh, we'll, we'll start, you know, studying the word like, uh, you know, we, we were uh, with the book of Philippians expositionally, where we would go verse by verse and study. But today, I want to share this message, and it's coming from a very deep place in my heart. And I want to share this message because of how much this message means to me. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, it's the passage of Scripture that uh, is very familiar to a lot of us. And more than any other book in the Bible, John actually talks about the love of God in this particular book in 1 John. And uh, especially in verse number 3, and we'll come to, us, come to 1 John later as well. But this is what the Bible says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are, right? There is a proclamation and there is a confident statement in that one verse. See what great love, right? The Father has lavished on us. I want you to underline that word, great love. I want to speak from the topic, good, good father this morning. And you'll come to know why in a little bit. But I want you to underline that word great love because I'm going to come back to it as well. Uh, the Father has lavished on us. John gives us this idea of the Father's love, of how beautiful the Father is and how beautiful the Father's love is. And the Bible says he has lavished that love on us. What is the, the meaning of the word lavish? It means not to hold back not restrained. It's something that is just given to us without, uh, you know, without looking at us, without, without merit, without holding back. That's the love that God has given to us because he's our father. Why? That we should be called the children of God. Do you know that you're a child of God today? If you don't, I want you to know that. And then he makes this beautiful statement. He says, and that is what we are. It's beautiful. The Bible is filled with examples of this father's love, y'all. It talks to us about who this father is. Uh, it talks to us through various examples, through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. There are New Testament examples that we come across very, very often, right? If it's the leaving of the 99 sheep and going after the one sheep that was lost, it shows the father's love in that story. It could be the father who awaits patiently for his son to return. The prodigal son as you and I know him, right? He, he patiently waits for him. The sinful son who has taken it all and walked away, but yet the father patiently waits for him to return. 
the love of the Father is so beautifully portrayed in the scriptures. In Genesis 1, God was known as Elohim. Uh, when we study Genesis 1 and verse 1, the Bible says in the beginning, God created. Uh, in the original translation, the Bible says in the beginning, Elohim created. Elohim, the word Elohim, the name for God was creator. God, the creator uh, was Elohim. When man was created, when God created man, Elohim became Yahweh Elohim. It was the covenant-keeping creator. The, the word Yahweh was the covenant-keeping God or the covenant-keeping creator as we would know Ye Yehovah or, or Yahweh Elohim, right? Because man needed that covenant. Because man needed the reminder that God loved him. So God became Yahweh for him because sin brought insecurity. Sin brought the fear that, man, we might be distant from God. If you look at Abraham, God changed uh, who he was to Abraham and he became the almighty God to Abraham or El Shaddai as we know it, right? When he could not perform physically, when he could not bear children, the Bible says in Hebrews that God empowers him, God fills him, God strengthens him. He stepped in as the all-powerful, the almighty, the El Shaddai and God gave him the ability to, 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 to create what wasn't there. And then there are the different names of God, Jehovah Jireh. We talk about Jehovah Sikano and, and all the other names. And that's a, that's a series for another time. But the name of God evolved as people knew him and wanted to know him today. God doesn't change. He's always remained the same. But we are introduced to another name in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, actually, the Bible talks to us about that name and reminds of that name in, in, in Romans 8, 15. And this is what the Bible says. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I hope you take notes because this is going to be a good study. Uh, this is what the Bible says. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Man, we are introduced to this name. If you ask me, one of the missions of Christ coming on earth was to introduce us to this idea of our Father in heaven. He came to take us from a place of no relationship to a place of intimate relationship. It's one of the greatest names for God, and that's the name Abba Father. This is the word that's not used in a formal way. Like, like you would say, Father, right? Or, you know, if I had to put on my British accent, like, Father, right? It's not, it's not a formal addressing of somebody, right? When, when I go and talk to my father, I don't go up to him and say, dearest father, can I please talk to you for five minutes? No, I, I call him daddy. I call him, you know, I, I call him, you know, like a son would call a father, right? Jesus taught the people that God was their father, he wanted them to understand that God was just not his father, but he was their father, right? He reminded them through the different teachings that he did. He said, man, it's your father. He says, your father feeds the birds of the air and that, you know, the birds that don't sow and don't reap, right? And who did not pick up a harvest. God feeds them. Your father feeds them. How much more will he feed you? How much more will he care for you? Your father. Right? He says, your father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. That's what the Bible says. He doesn't say, he doesn't say my father. He says, your father. The, the Lord's prayer, our father who art in heaven. Right? He teaches us that. There's this shared ownership of who God is and, 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 and the knowledge of the fatherhood of God is beautiful. I know, I've, I've known this and understood this as my daughters have come into the picture. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old and a lot of you probably know them already. But when my daughter, my four-year-old, my one-year-old hasn't come to that point, but when my daughter has a problem, she comes up to me and, and, and you know what she calls me? She calls me daddy. She calls me, or, or she calls me dada. One of these two things. My one-year-old has actually picked up from her and she, she screams out. She says, dada, dada. She looks at my wife and says, dada too. She has this idea of, okay, sissy's calling them dada and, and they literally turn around and say, yes. So let me just say dada as well. They pick up on that, right? The other day, Michaela, my, my four-year-old, uh, she started screaming. She said, dada, dada. I said, what? She was, she was screaming like she was in trouble. And I said, what's going on? She says, I have a problem. 
I said, you have a problem? She loves using that phrase. I have a problem. She uses it a lot. She said, I have a problem. And the moment she said, I have a problem, I'm like, okay, this is not as serious as it is or there'll be a lot of crying and hollering and screaming. And I said, Mickey, what's your problem? And she says, I have an itch. Uh, I said, you have an itch? <laughs> and I said, you have a problem and the problem is an itch, right? Uh, and and she's, she's free to call, come to me with anything. And she knows that. She can come to me with her itch and tell me it's a problem, right? But when she comes up to me, she doesn't come up to me and say, Pastor Ashish, I have a problem. She doesn't say, lead pastor of Commission Church, I have a problem. She doesn't say, thou that feedeth and clotheth and, and batheth me, would you be kind to draw your face towards me and scratcheth my itch? She, she doesn't say that, right? There's no formality involved with that. She's basically like, Dada, come here. She, she's free to do that, right? Dada, you know, is, is, is there within a moment, right? Like, like a knight in shining armor, making sure that he takes care of her problem. That's what Dada does, right? What I want to remind you today is he's a good, good father. How do I know that? Because I cannot even match up to, the, to, 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 to how much God means to, to even me. I've tried. Trust me. Right? I've tried to match up to the fatherhood of God and I've failed miserably. No matter how good of a father I try to be, it cannot even come close to the fatherhood of God. And I'm going to talk to you about the fatherhood of God in just a second. John 3.16 actually says this. He says, He loved us so much. That's what the word says. He says, For God so loved the word. Remember earlier I told you to underline a word that we talked about earlier? That verse that we read, it said this, For you do not, you know, uh, sorry, not, not in Romans, but when we when we, we actually went back to 1 John chapter number 3 and verse 1, we, we read that verse where we said, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. The great love is what John talks about. Here in John chapter 3 and verse 16, he talks about the same great love. He says, for God so loved us. The emphasis on that word, so not on the word loved, not on the word us. It's on the word so. It's a passionate kind of love. God doesn't do love. God doesn't show love. Man, let me tell you something. God is love. He so loved the world. Man, I don't, if you were to ask me about my fatherhood, I don't love my kids. I so love my kids. I dearly love my kids. I would, I would do crazy, extravagant things for my kids. That's what I would do. The other day, Michaela had this bright idea. She wanted to be a princess and she wanted me to be a prince. And she was watching something on TV and the princess was getting married to the prince. And she said, Dada, I want to get married to you. And you know what Dada did? Because I'm this crazy, extravagant, extra father. I said, let's get married, Michaela. I will be your prince. So Sonia was the minister and she married us in this very pomp and extravagant ceremony. I'm going to embarrass myself here and I'm going to show you a few clips of that video right now. Dun, 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 dun. Dearly beloved, we have gathered here together to join Princess Michaela and Prince Ashish in holy matrimony. Do you, Michaela, take Prince Ashish to be your father? Yes, I do. And Prince Ashish, do you take Princess Michaela? To be your daughter. I sure do. And that's what we did. We got together and we said, you know what? We're going to make this work. If that's a figment of your imagination, your data is going to make that happen for you. So I got dressed up. I, I pulled out something. I, I think it was a kurta or something from my, my, um, my closet that I pulled out. And I said, come on, baby, let's get married. Right? That's what you want. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to be a prince. I'm going to be a knight. <laughs> so that's what we did. Right? But that's how God is. That's how God is. We're the object of his obsession and there's nothing he wouldn't do for us and nothing can change that, y'all. That's something that I want us to understand. Nothing can change the fact that God loves you dearly, right? 
And there's no other story that can show us that than the story that I'm about to share with you guys. You know, 750 years before Jesus was, uh, actually came into the picture, and Jesus was introduced as the solution to sin as God intended him to be, right? God shows us his love through this man called Hosea, right? He comes into the scene after prophet Amos comes into the scene and prophesies to the people of Israel, and he dies and he moves on. This prophet called Hosea was picked by God. Most of the prophets of you actually know them. Prophets had peculiar assignments. They had these weird assignments, be it Isaiah or anybody. God gave them a certain assignment for that period of time. Hosea probably was the most inexplicable, ridiculous, insane, if you ask me, most the, the most peculiar assignment that God had ever given out. And you know what the assignment was? It was not a simple one. He looked at him and said, I want you, if you pick this assignment, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. I'm sorry, Lord, what? I, I'm, 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 did I really hear that right? And God's like, yep, you heard me right. Right? Not much of an explanation. Not much of, this is why I want you to go do it. Not much of, hey, I want you to do this because of this or because of this. He just says, he provides no explanation whatsoever. He says, I want you to go and marry this prostitute. Her name is Gomer. So, off goes um, Hosea. He has decided to take on this assignment that God has given him. He's a prophet. He can't understand why God would give him an assignment like this. The holy man that he is, he goes and marries this prostitute called Gomer, right? And for a few years, everything goes well, right? They have this baby boy, right? A few years later, they have this baby girl and then another boy. They're building a family, right? Marriage seems to be going relatively well. Judah Smith in the Hillsong Conference actually talks about uh, this beautiful um, uh, story as it unwinds between Hosea and Gomer and, and how God's beautiful plan is revealed through that story, right? One morning, Gomer is nowhere to be found. Um, uh, he wakes up, Prophet uh, Hosea wakes up. She's not in bed. Uh, he checks the closet. She's not there. She checks the bathroom. She's not there. He calls out for her. She doesn't respond. He goes to the kids' rooms. That she's not in the kids' rooms. She's gone. She's not out in the courtyard. She's not in the patio. She's not anywhere. She's gone. He waits and waits and waits. She doesn't come back. Think about it. Just up and gone. Back to her old life. Think about this moment. It's an it's a moment of utter embarrassment, right? And think about what I, I'm I'm putting myself as a pastor in his shoes. I'm supposed to be a prophet. God, I'm supposed to be this beacon of light and hope and I can't even keep my own wife at home is probably what this man is thinking. Probably had sleepless nights and some awkward conversations with the kids because the kids are probably wondering where mom is. And the kids are asking him day after day, night after night, where's mom, where's mom? And he's having to have these hard, crazy, awkward conversations with them that no father should be ha having with their kids. So God has his plan. He looks at Hosea after some time and says, Hosea, here's a plan. Uh, here's, here's the whole idea. He says, I want you to go find her. He says, judgment is coming. Right? He probably thinks that in his mind. He's like, okay, God has told me to go find her. Maybe God's going to punish her. Maybe God's going to look at her and say, how dare you do that to this man of God, my servant of God. He's probably thinking that, right? But no, you know what God tells him to do? He tells him, I want you to go and marry her again. Not only should you find her, I want you to go find her. And I want you to go marry her again. And this is where we pick up in Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1, right? Uh, uh, God is actually talking to him and he says, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Uh, it's 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 beautiful how this story unfolds. It's important to understand the culture of Israel back in that that time, in order to understand the context of what God is actually talking about here. The culture of Israel was going through a prosperous time. They were actually living in a peak of good prosperity. They had uh, their their economy was good. Everything was great and great. But they believed some. They had some skewed perceptions and misconceptions about love. They believed that love could be purchased. 
right? They, they believed that love was a product of self-gratification. The more they self-gratified, the more they felt loved is what they believed. And the third way, the third thing that they believed is that love can be found in inanimate, in inanimate objects or in things, in stuff around, right? And you know what that sounds like? It oddly sounds like what we're going through in our times today. It sounds like what we have going on for us today. God steps in and says, man, I need to demonstrate to them what love truly is. Here's a people that I love, that I dearly love, that I've saved them multiple times. But look, when prosperity has hit them, when good things have come to them, they have walked away from me. The heart of the father screams out and says, man, I love these people so dearly and they walked away from me. I need to bring them back towards me. I need to bring them back into the fold of the Lord. I need to bring them back into the fold of the kingdom. How do I do that? And he looks at Hosea and he says, I want to do it through your life, through your example. I want to show the people of Israel what true love is. The true love is not in inanimate objects. It's not in things. It's not in the, the treasures of the world. It's not in self-gratification. It's not in all of these things. It's in God and God alone. Right? One scholar talking about Hosea and talking about Gomer, he actually writes this. He says, outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the story of Hosea and Gomer is the greatest expression and the demonstration of God's love in Scripture. And I cannot agree more. You know what assignment was? His assignment was simple. Good. Simple. As, as God was putting it to him, it sounded simple, but it was not simple by any means. From a human perspective, what was the assignment? Go look for her. So think about this for a second. Here goes Hosea. He's like, God, this is going to be embarrassing, God. I'm, I'm out looking for my wife, God. And God says, go, I want you to go. He starts looking for his wife in places where men of God shouldn't be in. He starts looking for his own wife in places that he's never, ever stepped foot in before. He's actually about to step into places that he has looked at other men and said, you shall not and should not go into those places. He is about to step into those places. Think about him right now. The holy man, the prophet, the pastor, who's well known. Everybody knows him. Everybody is known as, that knows his face. He's asked to go into the red light district and walk up and down the alleys to make sure that he can check out every window possible to make sure that his wife isn't there. That's his task. Think for a moment. He approaches maybe a few men standing on the street and he's like, hey, have you, have you seen Gomer? And, 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 and they're probably looking at him and saying, you mean like, like Gomer, your, your, your wife? Like... Like your wife Gomer and he's like yeah like have you seen her I, I just you know she's I haven't seen her for a while and and they probably go nah man I, I don't I don't know I don't know where they where, where she is uh, um, you know I, I would think that you would know where she is and he says no uh, I don't I was wondering if you probably saw her somewhere around here right uh, and 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 he probably would probably look at him and say, no, the last time I saw her was that revival at that church a few months ago. And ever since then, I've not seen her. Think about the embarrassment, right? So Hosea probably keeps walking and uh, I'm, I'm just kind of, kind of, kind of going this, going through this as, of his search process. Keeps walking and, you know, he's wondering where she is and she'd probably see some of his guys standing around there and he's like, hey man, have you seen my wife around here? And, and, uh, and he, he's, you know, he's probably looking at him like, hey, bro, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't know that you guys were like still together. Like, um, my, my bad. Like, uh, I thought, I thought you guys were like separated or something happened. But uh, yeah, I did see her a couple of days ago. My bad, man. I'm so sorry. And he's like, no, it's okay. It's, it's fine. It's, it's whatever. Like, think about Hosea right now, right? Like, think about what he's going through right now, right? He finds her eventually. And he finds her eventually. What most scholars and commentators actually believe is that he actually walks in on an auction. And he says, excuse me, sir, that's my wife right there. 
and and the auctioneer was probably like, I don't care who she is to you, I don't care who she was right now, she's mine and she is for sale and this is the price that is on her right now. Like imagine Gomer standing over there in a public viewing of people, men that are standing around to put a price on her and bid on her to take her back home. Imagine Gomer. She can't even probably look at Hosea right now. She didn't imagine that he would come to get her. Like, think about her situation. She's like, why did you come to get me? What did I do to deserve you to come and get me? Here's Hosea. He might have to outbid other bidders, right? And the Bible says he pays 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley. If you go on reading in verse 2, that's what the Bible says. 15 is a significant number in, in God's interaction with humanity. Five is the, is the number of grace. Silver representing di divinity and barley demonstrating humanity. It, it represents humanness. And it's, it's Hosea standing in the middle of all these men that are trying to put a price on her. And he's basically saying, I will pay whatever the price is. But you know what the problem with that equation is? She already was his. Wait a second. Hosea, she's already yours, brother. It's okay, is what Hosea is saying. I don't care. I'll still pay for what's already mine. I mean, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but he still sends his son to die a shameful death on, the, on, on a torture tool designed for criminals to save a world that was in fact already his. It was, it was his plan. It was, it was his. The world was his, but yet he paid a price. You're already his, but remember he still paid a price for you. And you know then what, what he buys her? And what, he, what does he do next? Right there in front of everybody, in front of the people that he is embarrassed in, in front of the people that are mocking him, in front of the people that he is just put to shame in front of, he stands there and he says, come on, I'm going to make a vow to you. He does a vow renewal. Think about this for a second, y'all. Verse 3, he says this, he says, And I said to her, you must dwell this mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I be to you also. He renews his vows. And he says, hey, I will be with you till the end of days. I'm not going anywhere. And you should do the same with me. What would I have said? Probably not the same thing. Don't get me wrong. If that was me in Hosea's shoes, I don't know if I would have forgotten if I was a pastor. I, would, I don't know if I would have forgotten that I was a Christian and I was tasked to love and show grace. I don't know about you, but not me. I don't think I could have done that. But you know what verse 4 and verse 5 says? For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Verse 5, afterwards the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. He begins prophesying. The moment he renews his vows with his, with his wife, he then prophesies to the nation of Israel. And he looks at him and says, looks at everyone and says, guys, did you see what just happened? God told me to do this. And the reason I did this is because you won't believe. This is a direct representation of the plan of God in rescuing you and me. He says, David, David was the messianic standing. He didn't know about Jesus. He didn't know about that name as yet. So he used the word David because the son of David, he, he refers to Jesus as David. And he says, David, you know, is, is coming, right? The Old Testament, the people lived in terror of his judgment and wrath. But Hosea just brought his harlot back and he prophesies about a good, good father. He says, guys, y'all might be in sin. You might be, you might have walked away from God. But that doesn't change the fact that your father is still good. He is still great. He is still wonderful. If you ask me who is Hosea, Hosea is God. If you ask me what Hosea means, Hosea means salvation. Do you know what Gomer means? Gomer means completeness, completion. That's what Gomer means. 
Who is Gomer? Gomer is me. Gomer is you. God won't stop. God is the Hosea that will keep going till he finds his Gomer. And who is this Gomer? That's you and me. He won't stop, will he? He will search all the most despicable places on this planet for you because that's how much he loves you because he's willing to pay the price for you. And remember, he's already done it. He took the cross. He went up there and he took that death for you and for me. He took back what already was his. Think about that for a second. In Psalms 139, the Bible says, If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. There's no escaping from God. He is the hound of heaven that keeps pursuing you and me. You know why? Because you are His. You were His to begin with. You made choices. You walked away, Gomer. You didn't deserve forgiveness. You didn't deserve grace. But guess what? He's a good, good Father. And He's coming back for you. And He'll go to places that He shouldn't be. He'll go to places that he was not meant to be in in the first place. Why? Because Jesus is my Hosea and he completes me. Gomer, your, your name needs completion because that's a prophecy of who you will be. Nothing can be added to you, Gomer. Nothing can add you, not your profession, not the choices you make, not the things that you do. None of this stuff will add anything to you. He completes me. He paid it all. You remember Jesus sitting with the tax collectors in Matthew chapter 9? I don't know if you remember that passage. But they come up to him and says, Jesus, why do you sit with tax collectors? Why do you sit with the scum? Why do you sit with these people that are, that are, that are so devious and mean? And, 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 and Jesus looks at them and you know what he, what he quotes? He quotes Hosea and he says, but go and learn. This is what he says, right? But go and learn. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Think about this. Jesus is saying, man, I am your Hosea. He's talking to the Jews who have actually heard about Hosea. They read about Hosea in their, in, in their, in their, in their readings in the Sanhedrin. And, and he says, I will pay whatever the cost is what Jesus says to hang out with these guys. And you know, that might come at the cost of not getting your approval, but Jesus says that's quite all right. You know something? It's quite messy when you have to save gomers. It's quite messy when you realize yourself that you're a gomer. It's quite messy when you realize that there are more gomers around you. This love is a messy kind of love, y'all. This love found me in my life of sin so I can confidently tell you that I was a gomer. I don't know about you, but I am a gomer. I was a gomer. And God in His infinite mercy came to the most dirtiest places in my life, in the most dirtiest of alleys in my life, in the red light districts of my life, and He came searching for me even though that was to mar His image. He was okay with it, but He came to pull me out of what I was going through. I can't, I can't help but get emotional when I talk about this because I didn't deserve his justice. I didn't deserve his mercy. I deserve death. I deserve punishment. You know what 1 John chapter 4 says? We read from 1 John 3 earlier, but 1 John chapter number 4 is what the Bible says, right? And I want you to pay close attention because this is a powerful passage of Scripture. I'm going to read this in its entirety around 14 verses. This is what the Bible says. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into this world so that we might live through Him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, prop propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Remember that word. If God so loved us, underline that word. We ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us off his spirit. 
Verse 14, and we have, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that, that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know that to believe the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love, underline that, because he first loved us. I also want you to underline verse 18 where it says, there is no fear in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Verse 20, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who loves his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You know, in 1 John, the word love is used 46 times in that one book. And 27 times in the passage that we just read. You know what the basic message is? Uh, the basic message is that we are loved. The most beautiful, powerful, majestic being in existence cherishes you and knows your name. That's what the Bible says. He knows you. And most of us will probably look at, look at each other and say, yeah, I know that, right? But John says that, man, we have, we have come to know and we have come to believe. And he underlines the two kinds of characteristics for those who know and believe. And he says, those who know and believe this love of the Father, they are fearless. That's what verse 18 says. Perfect love casts out fear. The ones that are loved are not worried. We do not fret. We do not be afraid. We're not fearful. That's what love does. Love perpetuates. It gives us that ability to trust. It gives us that ability to not worry. We are meant to walk in confidence. We are not insecure. Fear has to do with punishment is what the Bible says. We know that we are loved if we don't live in fear. We are meant to have confidence. And you know what the second characteristic of the one that knows and believes that he is loved is? is that we are free to love other people. That's what verse seven says. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. He doesn't say, man, if you don't love, something will happen to you. He doesn't give us a consequence if we don't love. He points to heaven and says, you can't help but love other people, but you know, when you love God, that's what it says. Right? Because you understand that love is from God. If you know and are loved by God, the most natural thing that happens as a result of that is that you show that love outside. The good, good Father shows His love no matter who you are, no matter where you are. Love embraced becomes love extended. When you experience that love, and that's what Hosea reminds her and says, man, I'm going to love you, but I want you to love me back. It's so important that the person that has experienced true love, trust me, this very act that Hosea did and showed her what true love was to go behind her, to chase her down and bring her back and forgive her and show grace to her will show her that love is not something that she should take for granted. So when she has experienced that love, love embraced becomes love extended. That's the rhythm. That's the flow. Love can't sit still. Love moves towards the beloved. Love initiates. Love sends. Love always has to be on the go. Love sacrifices. It will go. It will give itself up for the sake of the beloved. You know what love does? Love stays. It desires the presence of the beloved. And so it will stay. It will keep coming back even when the staying is hard. Think about Hosea. It was difficult. It was hard. But he kept coming back. And not only did he come back, he stayed. 
God's love is there. Don't question it. I pray that you will cling on to God's love. You will cling on to Him because He's doing the same. Your Father loves you. The good, good Father that He is. He loves you and He expresses that love to you. And verse 11 reminds us that. And it says, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God loved us as gomers, we are tasked to love other gomers with whatever it takes. This is the inconvenient gospel. This is the radical gospel that you and I may like or may not like. There's some of y'all that are sitting over there and like, it's tough. Some of y'all that are listening to me, you have gomers in your life that you need to deal with today. There are people that you need to chase down. There are places that you need to go to that your face shouldn't be seen or your, your presence shouldn't be in. But you know what? If Jesus could sit with the scum and quote Hosea, so can you go into your gomers, go into your situations where, where you think it's dead, where you think there's no coming back. That's the inconvenient gospel. It changes everything. My story is this. I was a sinner. But when I understood the love of the Father, when my Father came chasing me down, when I didn't deserve a church, when I didn't deserve an ounce of His forgiveness, when I didn't deserve an ounce of His grace and His love, when I was deeply rooted in sin and I didn't want to come out of it, I felt the undeserving love of God and I felt the undeserving power of God Power through my life and show me who He is in my life. I understood the love of the Father. And here's my question to you today. Would you go after Gomer if He wanted you to? If God looked at you and showed you a Gomer that you need to go after, would you go after that Gomer? Or would you sit back and say, it's not convenient for me? Guess what? The gospel is inconvenient. And God looks at you and says, I want you to love people, all people. No matter who they are, no matter if they undes they're undeserved of your love. If they don't deserve it at all, it doesn't matter. They are my creation. And if I offered love to you, and if you were a gomer, I want you to love on people unconditionally the same way. I want to leave this word with you this morning, but there are some people sitting over here that or listening to me that need to make a decision today. Some of you are standing on that auction table behind that window. You're a gomer that you're a sellout. But God looks at you and says, I love you so much that I've I've still pursued you. That's the God that I serve. He's He's a God, the good, good father that keeps coming back to the garden even though you sinned, Adam and Eve. I always talk about this. The love of the Father can be understood in that one act where He doesn't stop coming to the garden because Adam and Eve sinned. He keeps coming even though they sinned. That's the characteristic of a good, good Father. And He's looking at some gomers today and saying, you deserve me. I deserve you. Give me a chance. I'm going to have the worship team come back and just lead us in a few moments of worship. Man, what a powerful worship session we had today. And as they lead us in a few moments of worship, I'm going to ask them to lead one of those songs that they did earlier. And as they lead us in worship, I want you to worship with. If you need to get up from the comfort of your, of your couch, if you need to get up from the comfort of your bed, please, I want you to do that right now. Would you please consider doing that? I want you to be free in worship today because I want you to understand that there's a heavenly father that loves you. You might have had a very bad experience with an earthly father. You might, you might have had some kind of abuse, possibly. You might have never had a relationship that you've wanted, probably, with a father. I was talking to somebody the other day, a good friend of ours, and uh, she just lost her father not too long ago. And I was talking to her and she, she was able to visit with him uh, you know, a week before he, he passed away and was with him uh, in his final moments. And she said, I never had a good relationship with my father. But that one week, we were able to talk, even though he was not able to speak to me. 
She said, it was like he understood everything that I was wanting to say to him. And she said, I felt so much of peace and forgiveness inside of that room that is incomparable. You know, she would have never been able to do that unless she understood the true love of her father. It's so important for us to understand this. The love of your father teaches you. The love that he shows for you, the Hosea's love that goes after the Gomer, that's what he did. He had you. You were his. But he still went to the cross. He still paid what, was, what, 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 what they demanded of you. He was a propitiation is what the Bible says. He paid it all. And he said, she is mine, he is mine. And when you and I understand the power of that inconvenient gospel, you and I will understand who this good, good father is. I want you to just take this moment and I want you to, I want you to just spend this time in praise. I want you to spend this time in worship. And as you do, I want you to just reflect on the goodness of God. If you need to ask for forgiveness, I want you to do that right now. If you want to get things right before God right now, I want you to do that. If there's a certain sin that you're dealing with. If there's a certain something that you've been struggling with, whatever it is, it might be lust, it might be pornography, it could be a bad, strained relationship with somebody, it could be a husband, it could be a wife. I want you to hold that person right now. I want you to, it could be a father figure. It, it could be somebody in your home. It could be a father. It could be your own father inside your home that you have a bad relationship with. Whatever it is, today there's healing. And in this place there is healing.
Father, I just want to thank you for this moment. Thank you because there's so much of healing. Thank you because there is emotional, physical healing that is happening in this place. What a powerful God we serve. God, would you move in a powerful way in some lives today? And I pray that we will understand the love of a father just like you loved. I pray, God, that we will be able to love the people around us. It's an inconvenient love. It's an inconvenient gospel. But God, we are not ashamed. If you're not ashamed of us, we're not ashamed of you. Lord, would you please give us the ability to love unconditionally. Our glory and honor be unto you. We thank you for each and every person that is tuned in today. And I pray, God, that each and every person will understand the love of their eternal heavenly Father. For God so loved us, the great love of God. I thank you, Lord, for that great love. I thank you for that extra love that you sh showed us and you bestowed upon us. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me give you the benediction this morning. God, would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Would you lift your countenance their direction? Would you give them a peace that passeth all understanding? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for tuning in. Once again, happy Father's Day to all the dads that are watching me today. I pray that you will have a great day, that you will be blessed. I pray that you will share this message with somebody. If this has blessed you, share it with somebody. Send it to somebody. Send the YouTube link. Send uh, this Facebook feed to somebody. And I pray that they will be blessed by it also. God bless you. Thank you for joining us in worship once again. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us today. Make sure you share your notes and tag us on our social medias on Facebook and Instagram at The Commission Church. And I hope to see you all next week. Take care.